In Chicago, two comedian skeptics named Andy and Art were mysteriously abducted by the illusionary mastermind and conspiracy theorist known only as Mr. Mr. Bunker. Bunker. The following serves as a record of Bunker's attempt to convince non-believers of the truth about conspiracies and paranormal activity. Andy and Art give an uninterrupted presentation and verdict on the plausibility of these offbeat topics, delivering what they call the, the whole enchilada. enchilada. Will Mr. Bunker convince these two skeptics any of this is real? Will it convince you? Everybody, welcome back to Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time Podcast. As always, I am your co-host, Arthur Stone. And with me, as always, is your co-host, Andy Hart. Hello, listeners. Andy Hart. Hello, Art. Hello, Andy. Here we are again. Here we are again in the bunker of dreams. This, uh... I don't know if you saw, but uh, Bunker added a new record player, and all the songs are him. It's just him singing covers you, uh, of the biggest adult contemporary hits. <laughs> like Michael McDonald. Of the 70s, 80s, and today, if it were the 1990s. <laughs> For those of you just joining us, welcome. Uh, Thanks for being here with this us. This is Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time Podcast. Neither of us are... The titular Mr. Bunker. He is a rabid conspiracy theorist who every week abducts us, Andy and I, and brings us to his underground every bunker. Every week. Every week for the past six weeks now. We've been abducted. Happened. We've been abducted. And uh, he brings us down to this bunker and forces us to podcast about conspiracy theories in an attempt to both convince us and you, the listener, the dear listener, um, that 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 all of this is real. Um and today is no different, Andy. It's just another day. What's become just another day? Just another day out here in the bunk. Uh, this happens every week, listeners, where we say that we're going to finally do something about it. But, you know, Andy, here's the thing. The weather's been really bad. Mm -hmm. It snowed. It's unusual. It's almost May and it snowed. Okay. Yeah. And you're going to expect me, like, I'm in my springtime mood. I'm getting ready to start wearing short sleeves outside with no jacket, mind you. Slow down. I'm okay. <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit more summer wear, right? Like late summer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Spring wear is more of a long sleeve with no jacket. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, you work up a sweat when you walk. Oh, do I ever. <laughs> Andy works up a sweat just kind of. <laughs> being. Just being. Andy is sweat personified. Yeah. <laughs> I'm anthropomorphic sweat. <laughs> um. But it was cold. It was snowing. The weather was crazy. Are you going to expect us to like, I don't know, like call 911 or something? Like, that's a, that's a little much. You know you what they say, Art? Life Hands is lemons. what they, yeah, they do say that. <laughs> I cut you that's off. That's not where I was going to go. Oh. Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. What? Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Who said that? Hallmark? Oh, probably. Is that a Hallmark? Might be. <laughs> The point is, we were busy making other plans to call the police and have this place investigated and all that, and life is what happened, okay? Andy and I had to stop for a little grub on the way home, okay? And it's like, what do you, like, we just got abducted, and it's like, I'm not going to sit here and eat this bunker food, like. We can only eat so many cans of hormone chili. Yeah, hormone chili. Yeah, we can only eat so many cans of hormone chili. <laughs> I mean, we're getting huge, man. All this growth hormone that he's pumping us full. Yeah. I've got my quads are way overdeveloped hair in places I didn't know existed. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. But yeah, we can't, you know, freeze dried mac and cheese. Come on, man. You know, what that's doing to my bowels. Yeah, I do know. Yeah. Because the toilet. It's not behind a closed door. Yeah. <laughs> the bunker toilet in the layout, the blueprint is open. There's no door. It's open. Uh, it's an open concept toilet. Open Bunk, concept bathroom. Bunker didn't think this through. He didn't plan for there to be guests. And you know what? To me, 
that's a bit inconsiderate wow. because here we are. Andy, he's going to hear this and he's going to. I want him to know it. Oh, f- he's going to put you in the timeout corner. That's fine. You want to go back into solitary? I accept that. Okay. Well, listeners and bad boy Andy, who's about to be put in the timeout corner. I'm a bad boy of the bunker. <laughs> You're the bunker bad boy. Bunker bad boy. Andy, Andy, the bunker bad boy heart. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I, oh, I felt like you were going to go on. No, oh. I was just saying it. Oh, um, how did, how did bunker bring you here? Let's, you know, the spiel listeners. If you've, if you've caught up this far every week, it's something with this guy. It's unbelievable. So what happened this week is I was feeling a little hungry. Mm-hmm. So I did what a lot of people do. I ordered myself a Domino's pizza. Okay. And Domino's, not that bad. Shout out Domino's, not that bad. You guys turned it around. You admitted your mistakes. I'm sorry. I'll get off my soapbox in a minute about Domino's, but you know I get fucking fired up about pizza. He, Art, listeners, you don't know this, but I know this because I know Art. Art is like a pizza prelate. (laughs) He's probably been sainted in the Church of Chicago Pizza. And someday he'll go on a crusade to New York to bring down New York pizza. I've been there. I've had it. It's fine. Listen, we're not going to get into this right now, okay? Okay. I'm going to get real riled up. So this is another episode. I swear I will get fucking, I will start getting peeved. And you don't want that. (laughs) He's starting to get peeved, folks. Domino's, shout out. You guys turned it around. You admitted your mistakes. Pizza is decent now. Anyway, you ordered Domino's. I'm sorry. And the app tells me, hey, this is getting delivered by us. One of them self-driving pizza delivery cars. Very cool. Very cool. But the I'm pizza, like, very hot. <laughs> that pizza should be surface of the sun. <laughs> Never touched by human hands. <laughs> Only by hot little robot hands. <laughs> Sexy little robot <laughs> hands. Sexy robot. God damn. <laughs> so, so anyway, I go out to the curb to, uh, to grab that pizza. Grab that pie. And the door opens to the car. And there's my little pizza sitting in there. Next thing I know, I get pushed from the back oh. into the car. It's bunker. It didn't drive itself. He just got out when he got there. And, and you he, know what? Yeah. The pizza box was empty. Oh! Motherfucker didn't even bring me a pizza. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And you wonder, folks, why we have to stop for a bite to eat. Yeah. On our way home. He couldn't even do the decency of actually bringing... He got the Domino's costume. He got the Domino's car. He was. He didn't even need to be dressed like a Domino's driver. Because he was behind me. <laughs> I didn't see him. He set it up. There was no driver. He's wearing a Domino's costume. He's got the, the little thing that you put on the car. The light with the Domino's logo. The Domino alarm siren that gets you through red lights. Yeah. <laughs> and other cars have to yield to yeah, you. Yeah. He had his Domino's badge. <laughs> Much- he had his... his his Domino's nightstick. His pizza gun. Yeah. It shoots uh, marinara sauce. It shoots scorching hot marinara. Yeah, he was a Domino's officer of the pizza law. Officer of the pizza law. Uh, his mozzarella nightstick. So slimy. Should be refrigerated. <laughs> and here I am. Man, I can't believe he has this jurisdiction. He... He didn't. He usurped it. <laughs> this is not legitimate authority. Wow. He he must be on like he must be in some kind of mood because you know if he was willing to kick you in the butt, he kind of did a similar thing to me. Yeah. He got after your butt too. He went after my butt. Uh, and he went after my buds and my bulbs. Let me let me let me lay it down. You doing drugs with him? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> in my backyard. Getting a lot of conflicting information. I'm having some issues with with my backyard. Do you mean your butt or? No, I mean my at, backyard. At your home. My, my home where there's grass. And there's some flowers that are sprouting up through fresh grass that I put down, some sod that I put down. And they're not, you know, so we didn't we didn't dig out the bulbs well enough. So these, these flowers are sprouting through. And I thought, oh, geez. So anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of nighttime. And I'm getting ready for bed and I'm taking my vitamins. My D3, my K2, my magnesium citrate, my vitamin C, my zinc, my ashwagandha. You know how I am. Why don't you just take a multivitamin? <laughs> Fuck that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't need all that stuff. 
I, need, I only need this 14 I need, things. Yeah, I don't need, well, I, need, I don't need the other three. I need specific doses of specific things, man, okay? Right. Yeah, I get certain IUs of D3 because I don't get enough sunshine. Anyway, so I'm walking back and I look out my back window and I think, I see somebody like pulling up some of these flowers. I'm like, what the hell? What the fuck is going on here? Well, I that walk sounds over. helpful. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe, but it's dark outside and that's creepy. Okay. And I notice they're kind of dressed like a spooky skeleton. Oh. They're in a skeleton costume. Mm. Very weird. Mm. So I'm about ready. I'm yeah, like, this all right. sounds like bunker. Yeah, I'm about to throw down. And in hindsight, hindsight 2020, I probably should have hindsight 2020. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> look at it. Look out for that movie coming out in 2020 hindsight. Oh. <laughs> Oh, no, I get it. You guys can't read my mind and understand that joke? Oh, oh I have to say it out loud? Oh, is that how this works? <laughs> anyway, hindsight. Cool, cool, I get it. Should have realized 100%. What is somebody doing in a spooky skeleton's costume picking flowers in my backyard? Right then and there, should have just stopped, called the police. But I didn't. I opened up my back door, and as I did that and I walked out, he was gone. And he kicked me in the butt. It was Bunker. He kicked me into a big old wheelbarrow. He was inside your house? No, he. I walked. I was opening the door, and I walked out to the backyard. Oh, once you got outside. And then all of a sudden, he was gone, and then he kicked my butt into a wheelbarrow. Barrow. Barrow. Yeah. Barrel. It's barrow. Wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrow. That's a tough word for me to say. <laughs> because I got bad memories of those. Why didn't you just wheelbarrow climb out? killed my family. Oh. I couldn't, because he dumped a bunch of manure on me oh and mulch and flowers i was pinned i was pinned in the wheelbarrow you're buried alive yeah and then you know what i never asked him why he was dressed like a skeleton so it was him that was dressed like the skeleton yeah the guy loves costumes he does every week it's a costume even if he doesn't need it he's got some sick fascination with this he really does at this point it's like you could easily he's just... targeting us it's <laughs> well i think that's apparent it's at first, I was willing to think that, oh, maybe this is just coincidence, and and I'm like some, some sort of fool. Well, but mm, okay, I might still be a fool, but in this case, Andy, you're gold. He's targeting us. Fool's gold. Okay, that's uncalled for. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, at this point, it's like, dude, you could just, you just stuff us in a van. At this point, it's like, but no, it's the elaborate costumes every week. He loves it. He gets a kick out of it. Oh, he's dressed like a big old spooky skeleton. I don't get why. Dressed like a Domino's pizza officer of the pizza law. Well, Andy, you know, our butts got kicked this week. And likewise, the butts of many the FBI, <laughs> many of the FBI have been tickled and kicked by the man known as DB Cooper. It's a Thank real Thank you. Sticking with me, listeners. I got I fucking I brought it around. It's a real butt tickling adventure. <laughs> listeners, you're gonna love it. Your butts will be tickled. Oh god. Your butts are gonna be tickled, but you better keep those butts in your seats because this story, Andy, this mystery, it's an interesting one, right? Mm, it's it's wild. It's fun. It's, oh, I don't want to say fun, but it's very interesting. It, uh, there's a lot of intrigue in it. Yeah. Um, it is the only unsolved case of air piracy in the history, the history of commercial aviation, which this week, Andy, we didn't even mention. Yeah. When Bunker stuffed us down here, he made an announcement. It's Airline Passenger Appreciation Week. Last week was Airport, Airport appreciation, appreciation Week. Today is Airline Passenger Appreciation Week. Is this going to become a thing that Bunker does? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. That I don't know. He already has to make up a lot of costumes. Yeah. He's got to also make up holidays now, too? <laughs> What's next? I don't know. It just feels like... Catchphrases? Is, it feels like it probably won't, because this is like part of a series. <laughs> That's right. It just somehow... It, Last week, we did his, Denver International Airport. I don't understand how he celebrates his holidays. We don't know. We don't ask. That'll be another episode. Yeah. But, Andy, uh, you know, all of you out there who are airport passengers, maybe you're listening to this on a airplane right now. Um, you know what? Kudos to you. Good on you. 
you're on that airplane and you're a passenger and you're eating your little pretzel snacks and you're having your complimentary drink. You're having a good time. You're following the rules. You're listening to that sign. You're not putting your tray down when you're, you're not in takeoff. smoking. You don't smoke. But Andy, we will get into this, but in this story, this takes place back in the 70s when you, you could, could smoke. smoke. Disgusting. Also, thank you listeners for not depressurizing the cabin. Yes. Don't do that. Keep yourselves under pressure. Doom, 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 doom. Bink, bink. <laughs> um, folks, let's not delay it any further because we want to get you the whole enchilada. We want to give you all of this plane. We want to get your butt tingling adventure started. Yeah. We want to tickle your butts. And oh, God. <laughs> That's on record. This exists forever. <laughs> Art wants to tickle your butt. <laughs> Uh, folks, without further ado, we're ready for takeoff. Your your co-pilots here are Arthur Stone and Andy Hart, and we are about to depart Bunker uh, Airport uh, on flight six with on, on destination on destination. You learning about DB Cooper because we're talking DB Cooper here on Mister Bunker's Conspiracy Time Podcast. So here is D.B. Cooper. Andy, America loves a good anti-hero. You got your Walter White. You've got Tony Soprano. You got Michael Douglas and Falling Down, and that's just a few, right? You combine those with a mystery, and maybe that's why people are so fascinated with D.B. Cooper. The man who hijacked a Boeing 727 in Portland for ransom and was never caught. Was D.B. Cooper just a disgruntled man, fed up with society, who decided to stand up for himself? Or was he a fraud, covert undercover agent? Why was he never caught? Andy, let's explore the mystery of D.B. Cooper. Yes, Art, let's. First, let's set the scene here for the listeners. Right. It's Thanksgiving Eve in Portland, Oregon. Right. Probably a nice, cool, rainy day. A man of average height, like 5'10"-ish, enters the Northwest Orient Airlines Terminal at Portland International Airport. This man is carrying a briefcase and wearing a long black trench coat, a plain dark suit with a neatly pressed shirt, and, make a note of this here, listeners, a black clip-on tie. So he's your average Joe Schmo businessman. He goes up to the counter to get his ticket. He identifies himself as Dan Cooper, and he uses cash to purchase a one-way ticket on flight 305 to Seattle, which is just like a 30-minute trip. The flight had, you know, made some other stops, uh, in different cities before it got to Portland. And uh, by the time it arrived there, it was about a, th- a third full. Uh, Mr. Cooper takes his seat near the back. He lights up a cigarette. He orders himself a bourbon and soda. And the flight takes off at 2.50 p.m. on time. The flight took off. And that's also where the story <laughs> takes off. Soon after the plane hits the air, Cooper hands one of the flight attendants Florence Schaffner, by the way, a note. At first, she kind of ignores it. She figures it's some creep or whatever, trying to give her a number, you know, uh, how it used to be for flight attendants. Yeah, that's right. Probably probably still is. Like, let's be honest. It's, I'm sure it still is. Sure. So she just stuffs the note in her purse. So Danny boy, he leans over to her and he whispers, Miss, you'd better take a look at that note. I have a bomb. I don't know if that was his delivery exactly or not, but that's my interpretation. Sure enough, the note states something along the lines of, I have a bomb in my briefcase. D.B. Cooper was a lot of things, Art, but a bullshitter, he was not. (laughs) That's right. So after she reads the note, Cooper motions for her to sit next to him. She does, and he shows her the bomb inside of his briefcase very briefly. Um, Afterwards, he lists his demands to her. Cooper wants $200,000 in, this is important, negotiable American currency. He wants four parachutes, two primary and two reserves, and he wants a fuel truck 
waiting for them in Seattle to refuel the plane. Schaffner relays Cooper's demands to the pilots, and when she returned, Cooper, chill as a motherfucker, is wearing dark sunglasses. Damn. Now, obviously, the pilots radioed into air traffic control in Seattle, who, in turn, contacted the FBI. So, the pilots and the flight attendants told the passengers the plane was experiencing a minor mechanical problem, so as not to cause a panic, of course. Uh, the president of the airline authorized the payment of Cooper's ransom, the $200,000, and the plane circled the Puget Sound for two hours while Seattle police and the FBI gathered Cooper's parachutes and the money. So as the FBI tried to give Cooper military parachutes, but he said, no, thank you, please. Instead, he asked for civilian parachutes with manual rip cords, which had to be gathered from a local skydiving school. So while the authorities scrambled around, Cooper chilled. He polishes off another bourbon and soda, and he starts remarking a few things to Schaffner. She recalls him actually being a very, uh, very familiar with the local terrain. He pointed out, looks like Tacoma down there, as they flew over it, and brought up how McCord Air Force Base was near Seattle, was near the Seattle Tacoma Airport. Schaffner actually described him as seeming rather nice. He wasn't cruel, like the stereotype of many terrorists or air pirates of the day. He was a thoughtful and calm guy. In fact. Cooper even paid his drink tabs and offered to request meals for the entire flight crew when they landed. And uh, so at 524 Pacific Standard Time, Cooper's demands were met. And at 539, 15 minutes later, the aircraft landed in the Seattle Tacoma Airport. So Cooper now instructs the crew to taxi the plane to a brightly lit section of the runway and close all the window shades. So then Cooper had the operations manager of the airport deliver the backpack full of cash and parachutes and his street clothes to the back of the plane. Now, when the goods are delivered, Cooper orders all the passengers and all but one flight attendant off the plane. While the plane refueled, Cooper outlines his flight plan to the cockpit crew. He wanted a southeast course towards Mexico City at, a minimum air, at the minimum airspeed possible without stalling the plane at a maximum of 10,000 foot altitude. He was very specific. He further specified that he wanted the landing gear deployed in the takeoff landing position for the entire flight, the wing flaps had to be lowered 15 degrees, and the cabin should remain unpressurized. The co-pilot mentions that the plane can't make it all the way to Mexico City uh, without another refueling stop. So they all agree on Reno, Nevada as the location for the second refueling. Biggest little city in the world, baby. That's right. So the plane's rear door and the aft staircase was deployed. Cooper requested that the pilots take off. But uh, the air traffic controller denied it on the grounds that it's unsafe to take off with the aft stairs deployed. So Cooper says it's safe, but he doesn't make a stink about it. He just decides to deploy the stairs once they're in the air. So Cooper also denies requests to negotiate or meet aboard the plane with the officials, authorities. And at 7.40 p.m., the Boeing 727 takes off. Now, after takeoff, Cooper instructs everyone on board to stay in the cockpit. At approximately 8 p.m., a warning light flashed in the cockpit indicating that the aft staircase had been deployed, just like Cooper said he would. Soon after, the crew noticed a change in air pressure indicating that the rear door was opened. 13 minutes later, around 8.13 p.m., the aircraft made a sudden, swift upward movement that the pilots needed to correct. At 10.15, the pilots landed the aircraft in Reno with the aft staircase still deployed. The FBI, state, and local police surrounded the plane, but after a thorough armed search, it was confirmed. Cooper was gone. Of course. The FBI went looking for him at this point. All that was left of Cooper aboard the plane was that iconic black clip-on tie. Remember that, listeners. We told you to make a note of that. Hope It'll come back up later. Just keep it in mind. <laughs> Think about it. And two of his parachutes. The FBI, local and state police forces, started to investigate and question possible suspects. The real key to tracking down Cooper, though, 
would be to find out where he landed, Art, if he landed at all. That's right. Now, two F-106 fighter jets and three other different aircraft tailed Cooper's Boeing 727 as it flew to Reno, but they stayed out of Cooper's and the pilot's view. Nobody really knew that they were there. Um, None of them saw Cooper exit the aircraft. But naturally, a man dressed in all black skydiving out of a plane under the cover of night is pretty difficult to track even for aircraft radar. So the FBI um, conducted an experiment in which they mirrored the flight path of the Boeing 727 and then pushed a 200-pound sled out the back in an attempt to recreate that upward bump that the pilots noticed around 8.13 when Cooper allegedly jumped. So they were successful and they coordinated that the plane was probably somewhere near Mount St. Helens or near Ariel, Washington, give or take, you know, 10 miles or so. But later later findings put it closer to the drainage area of the Washougal River. But we're still not really sure. Yeah, and that's because the FBI sent legions of agents, army soldiers, National Guardsmen, Air Force personnel, various aircraft, dogs in cute little vests, and civilian volunteers to scour the area. And nothing, Art, not a single trace of Cooper was found. But the FBI still had one last trick up their sleeves. They published the serial numbers for all the bills in Cooper's ransom money, but none of the bills have ever registered or shown up anywhere. That is, until 1980. In 1980, Andy, eight-year-old Brian Ingram was vacationing with his family along the beachfront property of the Columbia River, known as Tinabar, or Tenabar. Uh, As he was attempting to build a campfire, he uncovered three bundles of cash, two containing $120 bills, and the third containing 90 bills. The FBI confirmed these were part of Cooper's ransom money. But Art, what did all these bills tell us about Cooper's alleged landing spot? Mm, We'll see. Mm, You're right, we will. Uh, Let's go into it. The bills (laughs) landing in the Columbia River lines up with Cooper parachuting near the Washougal. Both rivers merge further upstream So maybe Cooper dropped the three packets accidentally in the Washougal and they floated downstream to Tinabar. But the physical evidence here doesn't match up with the geological evidence, okay? Why would the three packets be together? Why are 10 bills missing from one packet? If the bills floated downstream, the rubber bands holding them would have long since disintegrated. Okay, so a popular theory based on geological evidence of the surrounding dirt is that the bills would have had to have been buried by someone or something about a year after the hijacking. But nothing tells us how or why they ended up at Tinabar. But that's not all we have to remember Cooper by. Since the hijacking in 1971, up to this recording, this very recording in 2019, only four, four pieces of evidence have ever turned up. We have his alleged clip-on tie, which we're not even sure belonged to him. We have some of the ransom money that turned up in 1980, and in 1978, a placard with instructions on how to lower the aft stairs of a Boeing 727 was discovered in a deer hunting lodge um, north of Lake Merwin, but within Cooper's plane's flight path. In 2017, a group of citizen sleuths discovered what they believed to be a part of Cooper's parachute strap. But this is all still speculative. There are some interesting facts about Cooper's iconic black clip-on tie, though, and his parachute. In recent years, a group of citizen sleuths comprised of scientists and researchers, they've been working with the retired FBI agents close to the case in order to track down D.B. Cooper's identity. They've performed extensive tests on small portions of his tie. Now... See, ties are an interesting accessory as they they uh, rarely get washed like other clothes. You don't wash your, your necktie. I don't think I ever have. I, yeah, I mean, you might dry clean it, but you, you don't wash it really. And so, so since they don't get washed very regularly, they pick up lots of particles and microbes over the years. Uh, so this, this group of citizen sleuths, after examining the tie under an electron microscope, they discovered traces of titanium and other exotic minerals. In 1971, okay, only a manager or engineer at a fabrication plant 
possibly with aircraft, okay, would be exposed to such minerals. At least, that's what the sleuths say. But what about those multiple parachutes? Well, most people who assume D.B. Cooper lived, right, because we're not even sure he lived, right, to tell the tale, assume that he was also a expert skydiver. You kind of would have to be to, to jump out of a plane in the middle of night into the, you know, Portland wilderness. But, Just to even attempt it. <laughs> right. But Cooper was supplied with two parachutes and two reserve chutes, just like he requested. He chose an older parachute over an arguably better and newer sport parachute that he was supplied with. And for those two reserves, Cooper chose a reserve parachute that would not open. That's because it was clearly marked as a test parachute for training purposes and was obtained by the skydiving school in haste and allegedly, according to the FBI, on accident. But an expert skydiver would know that this is a dummy parachute that would never open. Right. And, and Art, while we don't know anything about who Cooper is, from the very little physical evidence and from his interactions, we can create a suspect profile. He obviously has some working knowledge of planes and the surrounding terrain. He may or may not have been an expert parachuter. And he may or may not have been foreign. When was the last time you heard anybody who's an American ask for a negotiable American currency. But Cooper's hijacking spawned a plethora of copycat crimes, okay? A few of which led to serious suspect considerations. Let's take a look into three particularly suspicious suspects. <laughs> Ooh, that's hard to say. <laughs> that's a tough one. It's a tongue twister. The first is a crafty hellraiser named Richard McCoy Jr. Ooh, baby. McCoy was a Vietnam vet and an avid skydiver. In April of 1972, he staged a copycat hijacking in line with Cooper's. He boarded the United Airlines Flight 855, which was the same Boeing 727 aircraft as Cooper's. McCoy brandished a paperweight disguised as a hand grenade and had an unloaded handgun, which is all very uncooper like He demanded $500,000 in four parachutes, and just like Cooper, he had the plane land, refuel, and retake off. And tried to ju and jumped out the back, but unlike Cooper, he left behind his handwritten hijacking note and fingerprints on a magazine. He was caught two days later with the ransom money. Here's a fun fact, Andy: He escaped prison two years into his 45-year sentence by crashing a garbage truck into the fence of the prison and escaping with some uh, convict buddies. Um, the FBI eventually tracked him down, and he died in a shootout with them. Which is very uncooper like But was he D.B. Cooper? No, probably not. McCoy had a strong alibi that he was in Las Vegas at the time of Cooper's hijacking and that he was with his family in Utah the day after the hijacking. All right, so that's McCoy. Now let's talk about the second suspect, who is our anti-hero, William J. Smith. Okay, so Smith was a World War II Navy veteran with experience in combat air crew training. After the war, Smith worked for the Lehigh Valley Railroad in New Jersey. A 2018 article by the Oregonian theorizes that Smith was directly affected by the 1970 bankruptcy of the Penn Central Transportation Company, which was the largest bankruptcy in the U.S. at the time. Smith was angry at the loss of his pension, the corporate establishment, and, here we go, the transportation industry, and he would have had a strong motive for the hijacking, as well as working knowledge of planes, trains, and, for comedic effect, automobiles, due to his military and work experience. So Smith also had connections to the surrounding train from an old railroad buddy who may have helped him in the hijacking. Uh, this article in the Oregonian, it further suggests that the particles found on the clip-on tie would have also been found in locomotive maintenance facilities. Is Smith our disgruntled anti-hero? Our 1970s Walter White? Our D.B. Cooper? Not according to the FBI. They pretty much haven't responded to the claims at all. So that leads us, Andy, to our third suspect, Robert Rackstraw. Rackstraw served in Vietnam on an army helicopter crew, and after the war, he had a few interesting criminal charges, which 
brought him to the Cooper's task force attention. He was charged with explosives possession and check fraud, as well as forging federal pilot licenses. So, Rackstraw had parachuting knowledge, he had explosives knowledge, I, he had I have a bomb note writing knowledge, he even looked somewhat similar to Cooper, the Cooper com composite sketches, but the FBI eliminated, eliminated him as a suspect in 1979 due to lack of physical evidence. The Rackstraw hullabaloo resurfaces in 2018 after a small cold case team led by Tom and Donna Colbert. Uh, they obtained a letter written in 1971, which was sent to various publications at the time, and it had coded numbers and letters on it. This amateur team deciphered the code, which matched to Rackstraw's army units. The team believes that the FBI refuses to comment on these findings because, well, they would have to admit that an amateur team cracked the case that the Bureau couldn't. Rackstraw's attorney, however, did comment saying that these findings are the stupidest thing he's ever heard of. <laughs> Uh, strong words. <laughs> um, okay, so where does that leave us with D.B. Cooper? Will we ever be able to track down his identity? Not according to the FBI, because they think he's probably dead. According to Special Agent Larry Carr, who led the Cooper investigation team until 2016, the plane was traveling at around 172 miles per hour. And as Carr says, no experienced parachutist would have jumped in the pitch black night in the rain with a 172 mile per hour wind in his face, wearing loafers and a trench coat. All that's not to mention navigating the wilderness at night and combined with Cooper's selection of the old parachute and dummy reserve increases his chances of death. Well, perhaps Mother Nature herself doesn't want us to ever find Cooper. See, the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens could have very well destroyed any remaining Cooper clues. Or, perhaps, Andy, something more sinister is covering up the clues. Cooper, after all, possessed a remarkable knowledge of important details about aircraft, which was not disclosed to the public. How did he know that the aft stairs could be deployed with a button near the rear of the plane that is impossible to override from the cockpit? Perhaps Cooper was an undercover CIA operative. Interesting. Now, Art, right, the same amateur sleuth team that shine the light on Rackstraw also reported that Rackstraw was working with the CIA and that the Cooper investigation and his real identity were likely being covered up. Rackstraw was indeed arrested and deported from Iran in the early seventies for explosives possession and fraud. Did Cooper slash Rackstraw have connections to the Iran Contra affair? Colbert's team also stated that their Freedom of Information Act request shed more light on Rackstraw's training, which included special forces operations. Why was the FBI so quick to dismiss Rackstraw as a potential suspect? Well, listeners, we may never find the real D.B. Cooper, but the story will continue to grip mystery lovers and amateur sleuths alike. D.B. Cooper's hijacking is the only unsolved case of air piracy in the history of commercial aviation, and it led to one of the most exhaustive manhunts and investigations in FBI history. Who was D.B. Cooper? Was he an anti-hero? Was he an undercover agent? Was he just some thrill seeker? While the FBI has since suspended its investigation into D.B. Cooper's whereabouts, it can't suspend this mystery from gripping our hearts and our minds. Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time podcast will be right back after this brief message. Hey, Bunk Funkers! This is Andy, and I'm here with my co-host, your co-host, Art. Uh, and we're coming at you today to let you know that we launched a Patreon. Uh, so if you have the means and you want to support the show, Come visit us at patreon.com slash MrBunkerPod and consider becoming a subscriber. Get an extra podcast episode every month of our brand new show, Andy and Art Debunked, available only on Patreon. 
We're going to be covering uh, various urban legends and myths. We'll do TV and movie commentary tracks and reviews. We'll do pop culture conspiracies and much, much more. Becoming a subscriber will also get you access to our Discord channel where you can chat with me and Art and other bunk funkers from around the globe. You also get plenty of behind the scenes content and much, much more. So please help us support the show and keep the lights on in the bunker. Visit us at patreon.com slash Mr. Bunker Pod and become a subscriber today. Hey, we are back, listeners. That was our presentation of research into the mystery of D.B. Cooper. Andy, this is a really fun mystery. This is quite an unsolved case, Art. It's nice. I, not a lot of, I mean, there's some conspiracy to it, but I, I just think, you know, it's a, it's your classic unsolved mystery. Like what, you know, how did this guy get away with it? That's what it feels like. It doesn't feel like, uh, to me. Yeah. I mean, we'll get to our verdicts later. Right. But this just feels like a good old-fashioned unsolved mystery. Something funky happened. And well, let's, nobody knows what happened. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the man of the hour, Mr. D.B. D. Cooper, Cooper. Who was not, let's, let's first clarify, this was not in the research, but it was a clerical error on part of someone at the FBI who mistook Dan Cooper, the name he actually used as DB. I don't know how that happens, but that's how yeah. he got the name DB Cooper. And that just kind of stuck. DB is the chillest, the chillest motherfucker on the planet, Andy. He's so chill. He's very chill. How are he's, you not amazed at his chillness? He's cal- well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you this much. He, in this situation, he's under control. Oh, yeah. He's in control, I should say. So, while I agree, a lot of people will get panicky, and he was real easy. He knew what he was doing. He's wearing dark sunglasses Clearly at night. knew what he was doing. I wear my sunglasses <laughs> at night. <laughs> so I can, so I can see the future. <laughs> what are the lyrics of that song? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he smoked eight cigarettes. Fucking orders another bourbon and soda. I, I mean, come on. I, yeah, but this was air travel in the seventies. How many other people smoked eight cigarettes on that flight? I don't know. Plus, maybe he was trying to uh, smoke those cigarettes to calm down. God, he seemed really fucking chill, Andy. Like he's the way he fu- like it's like a fucking beginning of a porno. <laughs> like he hands her the note. He's like, I got a bomb. And then, you know, obviously in the porn version, it would be in his pants. It would be in his briefs instead of his briefcase. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, just like, you know, she goes and he just hands her the note calmly and he just, and then it's just like she comes back and then he's wearing dark sunglasses. Like he's just like, like something in his head was like, oh yeah, put these on. <laughs> Fucking badass. You gotta admit. Maybe he's like, I made the human connection. Time to go offline. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that a criminal, because he is a criminal. At the end of the day. Like, all the, you know, we as a society, Andy, and, and we're fascinated with anti-heroes, right? We're fascinated with decent people. Because, here's the thing, like, obviously he's not a decent person, he's a criminal. He robbed stuff, and he probably, he terrorized the, the crew and the, and the flight crew, but... At the same time, he was very cordial. He wasn't a dick. He didn't really hurt. He he didn't cause physical pain to anybody. I'm saying it could have gone a lot worse. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying that in most scenarios where there's an air pirate, you'd want to have D.B. Cooper out of, you know, if you were going to have to be a part of one. He didn't want to cause any panic with anybody. Paid his Everybody got off the plane. Yep. No one got hurt. Except for maybe him. He Yeah, he could have died. We're we're fascinated by these people because people like Walter White, they're bad people. But for some reason, you just want to see them win. Are they bad, though? I think this gets yes. to that deeper philosophical question. He hurt people. Okay. Well, Walter White hurts people. But is but D.B. Cooper, though, is he a bad person? He didn't hurt anybody. Yeah, I mean, if we kind of take the idea, I guess the conspiracy that he's this Smith character who lost his pension, who is angry at... You used me for transportation. <laughs> you used me 
for land development. Um, that, you know, that he's like, well, fuck it. I served in the military. I'm a good person. I did right. And then they, they this dumb company goes and, you know, and him and his, uh, his accomplice, who I believe Dan Clare was the name, the, the accomplice that he allegedly had. They were mad. They were mad at the corporate establishment. And you want to root for that underdog. We love that underdog story. Yeah. I mean, I, it, I have a hard time saying that, sure, did D.B. Cooper commit a crime? Yes. Yes. But he committed a crime in such a way that nobody was hurt. It was so calculated. He committed a crime that really was for not indecent motive. If we follow the Smith hypothesis. Right. Of course. But even if you just take it in a vacuum and you just say what events happened in that, sure, hijacking a plane is pretty bad. But it was actually kind of commonplace during the 70s. A lot of plane hijackings happened. Yeah. And this People one trying to fly to Cuba, try to fly to wherever. It, this one, there's no, there was no panic. No. It's like when, it's like if somebody were to rob a bank and they pass a note across the counter and they get the money and they just leave. Right. It's a crime, but if you're going to commit that crime, that's the way to commit it because if there's, there's nobody be a in crime. Danger. If a crime is going to happen, you want it to be you want to be you want it to be with someone like DB Cooper who is under is, control. Is under control. Is a chill motherfucker who wears dark sunglasses inside, smokes cigarettes, drinks bourbons and sodas, and just is a chill. You motherfucker. definitely, yeah. If you have a criminal, you definitely want a criminal that smokes inside. <laughs> you know, smoking inside nowadays is probably a crime in most places. True, and. Uh, I am old enough to remember when you could smoke inside restaurants. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I support that legislation. <laughs> I'll go on record as saying that I'm glad you can't smoke inside anymore because I don't particularly care for cigarette smoke. I don't want your secondhand smoke killing me. You have a your right. Dirty little habit. You can smoke all you want, but I have a right to breathe air. And you know what else, Andy? Fucking vaping too. Come on. Don't who blow that you, vape in my face. You're gonna fucking, who are you kidding? You're freaking grape smelling friggin' fog. You kidding. Get out of here with that vape. Yeah. I, I'd rather you vape than smoke a cigarette, but still. But you don't have to do it toward me. You yeah. don't have to do it around me. I'm blowing smoke up my ass. <laughs> yeah. Why am I outside all the time with my ass cheeks spread open? And why are people always blowing smoke in directly into my butthole? <laughs> I'm sick of it, damn it. Give me some respect. <laughs> Just like D.B. Cooper, man. Give us some goddamn respect. Just a little respect. Um, At the same time... It is interesting how in control he is, which I think leads to the main conspiracy. Was he undercover? Was he an agent? Was he an operative? Why was he so in control? Is it because he knew, well, I'm never going to get caught. But at the same time, what the fuck? Why would that happen? Why would it? That'd they be testing? my question. If testing? he's CIA, what are they, what's the purpose? I mean, they drugged a lot of people with LSD. Maybe yeah. at the same time, we're like, <laughs> hey, let's see if we can rob planes. I don't know. Can we do it? Can we pull it off? <laughs> If we have this exact character who knows every little detail about the operation of the plane and yeah. knows exactly what to do to make it not a dangerous situation. Yeah. Or maybe they were just trying to run some, I don't know, some, or I, who knows, some kind of tracking device or something. And who knows what the fucking frat house that runs the CIA. <laughs> uh, Later on, they called up that pilot and they were like, look, <laughs> you passed the test. <laughs> You can uh, you can strip down naked and uh, we'll blindfold you and you'll drink 20 beers and jump on a bunch of nachos. You're in. Welcome to Del Delta Gamma Phi. Uh, Mother. Kappa Iota Alpha, the CIA. Well, I guess it's... Ah, whatever. Yeah. Kappa's with a K. I don't know. Who gives a shit? What's the C letter in Greek? It's all Greek to me. Hmm. Hey, after we get out of the bunker, let's go grab some... Uh, let's get a euro. Let's get some euros, baby. Yeah. Some souvlaki. Souvlaki. Tzatziki sauce. Spanakopita. Ooh, that's good. Tzatziki. Uh, Opa. Baklava. <laughs> Greek chicken. Greek potatoes. Greek salads. Of Avgalemono. Feta. Kalamata. These are Greek foods. 
Welcome to the Greek Food Podcast. We're going a little stir crazy. Bunker's not gonna like this oh, one. No. Oh boy, he's gonna be mad. Um, yeah, I, I guess you're right. You know, I, do you think he survived? Let's answer that. Do you think he survived? That's a great question. I'll be honest. I'm not convinced that he did. Wow. But Art, hold on. Buckle your safety belt. Okay. I'm not convinced that click, he click. didn't not survive. You're gonna take some kind of centrist view with it. Damn, I don't know. Because here's the thing, okay. I want to believe that he did. I want to believe it. I want to believe that it worked. But if somebody says, oh, nobody who has professional parachute, if somebody who's been investigating this for a long time says nobody with professional parachute training would have jumped out of the back of a plane going 172 miles an hour, especially not with that parachute, yeah. it makes me think if somebody knows how to parachute, maybe that is a bad thing to do. But the, I, I think... We didn't include this in the research, but there are, I think there are like other examples of people who did crazy parachuting stuff like that where they succeeded. Martin McNally is a name that you can look up. Um, and crazier things have happened, Andy. People get struck by lightning. You know, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Do you believe it or not? You have to either believe it or Part not. Part of me kind of believes that this motherfucker made it. But here's the thing. You land in the middle of the wilderness in loafers and a trench coat. Part of the argument is that this guy thought, like, fucking D.B. Cooper is playing, like, 20-D chess. This dude is thinking so far ahead, right? He He's thinking about how when he lands, he's going to have to hitchhike or he's going to have to, like, get somewhere, right? Like, nobody is going to take somebody. It, somebody's going to pick up a hitchhiker who's in a nice press suit, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, Part of it. Is that part of it is maybe he was like the Smith character who had working knowledge of the railroads and he had an accomplice and, but still you would have to land in a specific predetermined spot. And how would you coordinate that with your ground partner? You don't have a cell phone. You didn't have a walkie talkie. Um, I mean, in the seventies it would have been almost impossible because yeah. there was no, I mean, you wouldn't have had like access to a GPS or anything unless he was CIA. Unless he was CIA. Unless he was CIA. So you kind of just end up in the middle of nowhere and you just kind of have to hope that you run into each other. At the same time, jumping from that altitude, you would have plenty of time to somewhat control where you land because you're, you know, with a parachute. If he was an expert skydiver, if he was somebody who was used to this kind of stuff. And if he did survive just the wind chill alone, um, part of it is that his money's never really been spent either. Now, yeah, that you money were saying earlier, you asked me, how does a bank work? And I told you, I don't know how a bank works. Andy, I keep everything I own in a big burlap sack that I carry around with me everywhere. Right. He's got a, uh, folks, you don't know this, but I know this because I know Art. He carries a bindle with him everywhere he goes. <laughs> yep. It has all of his belongings. Yep. Couches. <laughs> have a corn cob pipe. Corn cob pipe. I'm frosty. Stay frosty. <laughs> what were you saying, though, about how how do you think he could spend the money? You know, it's, it's interesting because how... Because we know that money can be exchanged for goods and services. Right. That's a fact. If, if, you, if you were in a part of the country where there was a lack of maybe banking influence. Just consider that D.B. Cooper probably could have thrived on that cash for a while, at least, just using it locally if, if nobody was depositing it somewhere where the serial numbers showed up. Yeah. So depending on how how the FBI was tracking that, how they talked to casinos, different local businesses, local banks. Yeah. I mean, if, if he, if he was operating in a mainly cash economy without people are keeping the money in a safe or something, you think about it, you could probably get away with it for a long time. Yeah. If you didn't go somewhere where they were looking for the serial numbers. That's why I think people speculate that he might've been French Canadian without an accent because why would you say negotiable American currency? That's a weird thing to say. It's a weird thing to say. It's a very weird thing to say. I've never said that before because you just assume it's currency. <laughs> you don't even say the word currency. You'd probably say money. I mean, you could probably just say 200,000 US dollars. Yes. 
and then that would be the end of it. Right. But, you know, maybe he's a learned man or a weirdo. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or just... he just wanted to throw people off a scent because this dude's already thinking 20 steps ahead. Yeah. So why he's not? Out there. He's in the ether in a way. This dude, I mean, you gotta, you almost have to give, you have to give him a little props. The only unsolved air piracy case in commercial aviation history. Now, if this record was ever to be broken, it would have to happen back in the 70s and 60s before, you know, they had a lot of the, had a lot of measures that they have in place today with airports and, 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 and airplanes. Um, and actually, this is worth mentioning, you know, some people think that he lost all the money when he flew out of there, that just the wind and the, there's no way he could have held on or, and all the bills are actually searchable. And this will be included in our, um, in our show notes. Uh, all the bills are searchable via an online database. So you can go look up the money. No, oh, look up the DB Cooper funds. Mm-hmm. I was just doing a little bit of research here. Right? So yeah, you were on your phone. I'm listening. And you weren't looking up hentai i was i i'll admit because i walked in on you a little bit earlier in the bunker today okay you were in the open concept bathroom i was in the open concept kitchenette yes and i saw you yes they are adjacent and you you forgot to mute your phone before you started playing a video okay sounded like hentai it was hentai okay you admit it yeah on air yeah, on That's air. On record. On air, I will admit that. But it was for research, right? That I was using my phone to do a lot of research into Waluigi Hentai. <laughs> That's a different kind of Smash Brothers, am I right? <laughs> oh, baby. What were you researching? I was looking up, trying to figure out in World War II, during World War II, because we're suspecting that that Smith was maybe D.B. Cooper. Let's How- get the cat out of the bag. We both, we both kind of suspect. We think Smith if is it's the anybody, likeliest. Yeah, likeliest, of, of those yeah. three suspects mentioned. Right. How f- I got I was thinking how fast would a plane travel during a parachute jump? Okay. So I'm looking at this Wikipedia article on the D-Day parachute jumps and it says that the some planes flew faster though than the recommended limit of 110 miles per hour. Hmm. So how much faster? I don't know. Did all those people, did all those soldiers survive those jumps? I don't know. But for D-Day, they set a limit at 110 miles per hour. So Cooper would have jumped out of a plane going 60 miles an hour faster than that. That's right. That's that's quite a bit faster. It is. It is. Uh, you know, and no helmet, no face protection, no... Yeah, he had no equipment other than the parachute. Right. And raining. And they surmise that it was, or they say that it was probably like, you know, 15 degree wind chill blowing in his face at high speeds because you're up in the air. Right. It's fucking cold. Yeah. Um, yeah. Likelihood that he survives. Plus the terrain. Yeah, the terrain's tough too, right? You know, you mentioned that. No helmet. What if he hit a rock? Like well, that? he wasn't flying over a rock. He was in Portland, Andy. Uh, oh, I misunderstood. <laughs> you thought it was Portland, Iraq. Yeah, I was confused. <laughs> Thanks, listeners. The we'll old be Babylonian city of Portland. Yeah. Uh, you know, what if he hit something solid, though? Like you tuck and roll and then you... Yeah, because when you land in a parachute, it's not like... Doo, 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 doo. You, you actually, you still have some speed. You're <laughs> physics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you... You have some good momentum built up because the parachute helps deflect it, but you know you could still hit the ground with a pretty considerable force. But at the same time, why haven't we found anything? Now, obviously, Mount St. Helens kind of destroyed everything, but at the same time, they had a decade of looking for this guy. They found nothing. It nothing. But you have to think about it too. It's exceptionally difficult to find things in a wilderness area. It's true. Even things that seem pretty conspicuous, once you get into a wilderness area, and if it's a space that's not, that's completely undesigned, untouched by human hands, so to speak, it's really not laid out in any sensible way. So things are just happening. And we're not talking like one little area, right? Like a little forest preserve. This is like 
20, 40 miles of stretches of wilderness yeah. where we think he landed. Yeah. Th we think, think. Think how long it would take you to comb 20 square My miles hair? of hair. <laughs> you Just, need a big comb for that. That's You need one of those novelty combs from the county fair. <laughs> But just consider how long it would take you to even comb one square mile. Yeah. Uh, uh, Especially just, back in the 70s. Yeah, just an area that's a mile on each side, and you have to comb through that looking for clues of anything. It's raining. It's probably muddy. Any footprints that he leaves behind are just Get getting washed, washed away. away instantly. There's If he did die, wild animals could have come and scavenged his body. Yeah. And then Mount St. Helens erupts in Yeah, and then it destroys all the evidence that's left. Plus, they didn't exactly know the location until they did that experiment. They didn't have a good idea of where right. it jumped out until because, they did yeah, that. Because, yeah, when it first happened, they were like, oh, that was weird. And then they think, like, maybe that's when he jumped. And then when they recreated it, they thought, that's probably when he jumped. So you have to think that at first, they were probably looking in, the, in a very wrong spot. Right. Which, when... We're talking about finding one person in many, many square miles of, of space. Looking in the wrong spot can set you back a long time. Oh, yeah. You're just spending years, and it's just like people walking around. That's how they look for stuff. Yeah, they just like- You have no control whether those people are actually looking or whether they realize that they're finding a clue. And, I mean, a dark suit would probably blend in with the ground. Yeah. It may have been hard to see. Like- like you said, if it's raining and stuff, maybe it gets covered in mud. Maybe it's obscured. Um, what was I going to say? That's the real mystery. Tune in next week to find out what Art was going to say. <laughs> we'll get you all the research and give you the whole enchilada. Uh, well, okay, yeah, the Bills. Let's talk about the Bills. Okay. The Buffalo Bills. Used to be a good franchise, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, four Super Bowls is impressive, but come on, just win one. Jeez, just and ever since then, the oh boy. Oy, oy, oy. Um, I'm sorry to all our listeners in Buffalo. You have great chicken wings. Yeah, we love your wings. Very excited to try them. I've heard they're good. Anyway. Um, You've never had a buffalo wing before? I've had a buffalo wing, but they're never different in Buffalo. In buffalo. Yeah. Mm. The I Bills. Have. The Bills. Let's talk about the Bills. Obviously, they were planted by somebody. How the fuck did they get there? Somebody planted those that money. Then uh, that means that he. There's no other way because there was like all this land development that happened during, around the Tina or Tena Bar that happened. So like they know from geological evidence that like, you know, there's like clay, like kind of like the Dare Stone, like we were talking about that, like, right? In a similar vein, it's like the packets of money could only have certain geological evidence on them if they were planted a year after the hijacking in that specific time, they couldn't have washed down shore. They would have disintegrated. They had to have been planted. How the fuck does that happen? Who does that? Does he do it? I don't know. Was he just some thrill seeker who just realized he would never spend the money and just said, fuck it. I want to see if I can do this. It's my last hurrah. I could also see someone finding that stuff, maybe on a hike or something, and they go, hmm, and maybe they feel weird about it, but they don't know what to do with it. That's true. So they bury it somewhere. What would you do? If I found money in the wilderness? You know, it doesn't have to just be the wilderness, but you find money. Like, and you, like, let's be honest, you find a, a lot of money like that Man. in a briefcase in a sketchy area, let's say, or something, and you're like, hmm, what do you do? I'm worried right away <laughs> by picking it up. I'm not picking that up. I'm hesitant to put it in my, to have it on my possession, put it in my car or 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 take it with me somewhere. Right. I'm hesitant to do that. That's mob money, dude. Yeah, th there's something going on there. You know, I would probably... Uh, I'll be honest, listeners. I'll be. I'll give you the whole enchilada on what I would do here. I would probably call the police, hmm. and I would say, "Come and check this out." Anonymously. Yeah, probably anonymously, especially if it was a large amount of money. Now, this is not a humongous amount of money that At we're the talking same about time. Here. What if somebody sees you call the police? Then you're fucked. <laughs> Fucking Javier Bardem with his dumb uh, berries and cream boy haircut is coming to your house with his. 
animal bolt killing uh, piston thing, and he's fucking putting one right in your skull. His bovine yeah. slaughtering tool. Right. I, I mean, okay, that's... I'm fucking turning around and I'm walking away. That's, that's how me. I die. That's how I die then. You just accept it? So I, you gotta die some way. I walk away. I say, hmm, let some other fool deal with it. Nope. I, not happening. I'm DB Cooper and I'm thinking 20 steps ahead. I say, I don't need it. Walk away. Put on my dark sunglasses. Okay, so we've covered... Drink a soda. So we covered that, though. A bourbon-flavored soda. <laughs> bourbon-flavored soda. So we talked about we talked about that. Like, a large amount of money in a briefcase in a conspicuous area. What, though, would you do, Art, if you were hiking? Let's say you're you're in the wilderness and you're hiking and you find five thousand dollars wrapped up in rubber bands there's nobody around you i'd probably call that in that feels a little bit more like i'd maybe i'd wait like i'd go i'd walk back or something i don't know maybe i'd probably do it anonymously still what if you found a hundred dollar bill in the woods i'd probably take hundred dollars wow hundred dollars is not no one's coming looking for a hundred dollars <laughs> i might if I lost a hundred dollar bill, <laughs> fucking wipe my ass with a hundred dollars, dude. I'd be like, I need that back. <laughs> we actually do down here in the bunker. We have toilet paper that's, that's printed to look like money. Yeah, it's a fun thing. It's it's joke. It's joke money though. Obviously, it's not not look like real money. I think that bunker maybe has some connections to Spencer's gifts, and that's how he gets all these weird costumes and different things. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of interesting shaped sex toys around the bunker. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be into belt buckles. In high school, which is so cringy. Um, for like a while, I was into them. I thought they were the coolest thing. The uh, doo-wop group, the belt buckles? <laughs> no, just like wearing them. I thought oh. they were a cool fashion piece. So I'd get like different ones. Like I had one that was like a skull. I had one there that was go. like Nirvana. Nice. It was like a picture of Nirvana, the members of Nirvana. <laughs> I had um, an 8 by 10 photograph. <laughs> I had a few others that I can't remember. And I would go to Spencer's Gifts to... I would always peruse their belt buckles. They always had colorful belts and belt buckles there. Andy is fixing his headphones for those listeners who are getting a lot of extraneous noise <laughs> here in wrestling. Anyway, that's just a little, a little fun fact about me. That was a fun fact. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think, yeah, I think, you know, I play it cool with stuff like that, man. Like, I really am like, nope. No, thank you. Not getting involved. Mm. No part of it. But a hundred bucks, like, what are you going to call in a hundred dollars? If there's, is there someone around me? Maybe I pick it up and I say, Hey, is this your hundred dollars? Like, you know, if I saw like a hiker who walked past me, I would probably be like, Oh shit, that's that dude's hundred dollars. Then I pick it up and go try and track that person down. But I can't find, it's kind of like, you know, uh, like if someone leaves something at a store and then lost and found, after a certain amount of time, it's like, well, they're not fucking coming back. I might as well take this and make use of it, right? I have a confession to make. Uh-oh. Art. Oh, no. I stole an item <gasps> from the second city lost and found. What? The training center. This is breaking news, listeners. You, this is a first. I don't know this. I never knew this. That I am here sitting across the table from a fucking thief. A DB Cooper. There, it was a rainy day. More like PB Pooper. <laughs> PB, that's me, PB Pooper. PB Pooper. It was a rainy day, and what happened, you thief? It was a rainy day. I went to my comedic writing class. I did not bring an umbrella with me. It was pouring rain when it was time to go. The teacher of the class said, I forgot my umbrella too. There's usually a couple in the lost and found. We can just borrow. I never gave that umbrella back. Jesus. It's one of those like $3 umbrellas you buy at CVS. In fact, when it broke, that's what I replaced it with was an umbrella exactly like it for $3 from CVS. <laughs> and I still have that umbrella today. Wow. The fucking smoking gun. And you just held on to it. You're sick. You make me sick. I'm gonna puke. Put me in, at you. Put me in jail. <laughs> put you in Kegels. Jail. Oh, jail. 
Jail? Put me, put me in jail. <laughs> you go to the timeout corner after we're done this. I've earned it. I'm a thief. That's incredible. I stole stuff before, too, when I was little. <laughs> I oh, yeah, I, you had a history of shoplifting. <laughs> no, not that. I, when I was really little and I would go to day camp, um, sometimes I would sneak into the counselor's lounge or the counselor, like, I don't, I don't even know what it was, like their supply room. And I would take like little toys because, you know, like if camp counselors did like little games with us, sometimes you could win like little, little tiny toys. Like these were, if you were at Chuck E. Cheese, you would give like five tickets to tickets to get this toy. Like dumb little, you know, bouncy balls, jacks. Little sticky hands, things like that. Jacks from Mortal Kombat? <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. I stole mechanical arms. Oh my God. This is really sad. We're bad. Wow. You heard it here first, folks. We're both bad bunker boys. We're bad bunker boys. We're going to be in the timeout corner after this episode. We're both basically on par with D.B. Cooper. Andy, that... Yeah, we were chill as could be. <sighs> that brings me to another point. Okay. D.B. Cooper as we kind of feel, is this anti-hero who said, fuck it. You know, my pension's gone. They took my pension. They fucked me over. Corporate greed. They went bankrupt. So now I'm going to steal something back. Has there been a time in your life where you reached that fuck it moment? You know, like, for example, Walter White is living paycheck to paycheck, working in a job where no one respects him, and he just found finds out that he has cancer. Right? That's the basis for Breaking Bad. He says, fuck it. And that's what drives him to a life of crime. Same with Michael Douglas in Falling Down. And Tony Soprano, he's, well, he's just kind of a criminal. But he's an anti-hero because we feel bad for him because he talks to his therapist. And he has a family. But what was your fuck it moment? Do you have one? And you did something against your better judgment? Um, Don't tell me you fucking stole a plane <laughs> from the second city lost and found. I I hijacked an airplane that was in the second city lost and <laughs> oh found. Oh, my God. I'd had enough. No. Tina uh, Fey's plane that she keeps in the second city lost and found in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I did that to you, Tina. You know, Art... I, I don't think that in my life that I've had like this big, like this big fuck it moment where I said enough is enough. I'm fighting back against the powers that be. It doesn't have to be something crazy big, but even something like where you just told someone off or, you know, even though you know that it would cause repercussions. Oh, I'm conflict averse art. That's true. I typically don't do that kind of thing. Yeah. But I'll tell you one place, and you know this, listeners, you don't know this, but Art knows this because he knows me. Oh. One place where I'm conflict forward is driving a car. <laughs> and I've gotten to yeah. a, a point a lot of times where I'll be like, oh, I'm going to follow the, the law. And then eventually I'll be like, fuck this. And I'll just break the law. You've gunned it a lot. You've rushed past people who were trying to overtake you uh, many a time. I've been in a car with you where I've said, Andy, Jesus, <laughs> what are you doing? And you're like, what? all the rest of my life, I don't engage in very aggressive behavior. Right. And it all comes out in the driver's seat. <laughs> it's bad listeners. If you ever have a chance to be in a car with Andy, which I hope you do. A lot of people have had the opportunity. And frankly, I've gotten pretty positive reviews about my companionship in the automobile. Yeah. I've spent many a car ride with you. Oh, yeah. We've spent a lot of time in the car. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. All those trips to Detroit. In the front seat, though, folks. Oh, boy. Well, um, I don't know, Andy. Should we get to it? Should we give kind of our, our summation of this, our final verdict? Our... Do we want the listeners to tell us? Oh, yeah. Their fucking moments? Yeah. Okay, listeners, if you have a moment where you said, fuck it, yeah, tell us about it. Tweet at us, at Mr. BunkerPod. Email us, MrBunkerPod at gmail.com. Use the hashtag... Fuck it. Fuck it. <laughs> what else can we say? <laughs> fuck it. Uh, look forward to hearing from you. All right. Verdict time? Yeah, sure. 
Court is in session. As they do. They fire a machine gun. (laughs) Fire a machine gun at a humongous bass drum to open court. (laughs) 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 (laughs)
developing. They were testing weird GPS stuff. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, he could have had the CIA down ready to help him. I don't know. And they just needed a motherfucker crazy enough to jump out of an airplane. Why they would need to do it out of a commercial airline, I don't know. <laughs> That's, you know, you know, it's plausible minus on that one. On the verdict of, you know, and, and but I also want to say that Rackstrom has some sketchy stuff like being charged with explosives and check fraud in Iran and then deported. Uh, it's a little weird, but you can kind of chalk that up to Vietnam vet. The war was very difficult and the veterans didn't get the care that they needed. So, you know, maybe you go to Iran and you do some sketchy stuff and you figure your life out a little bit later. Yeah. We've all made mistakes. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not, I, I stole toys one time. I took that umbrella. That's right. I think I'm with you though. Plausible plus on it being Smith. If it's anyone, it's Smith and you want it to be Smith. Yeah. Because he's a chill dude. You don't want it to be McCoy. No. no McCoy as was, much a character as he is. Yeah, he was a loose cannon. And Rackstrom is, doesn't, I don't think Rackstrom wants any of this attention either. Because It just doesn't make you it, know. it doesn't move your needle. You yeah, like, like you found some hidden decoded messages in some letters. It's like, well, eh. I mean, the motive's there for Smith. The, the help is there. The, you, you, the, the knowledge is there. I mean... Yeah. Anyway, for survival, I'm going straight plausible. Hmm. Okay. Because I want more to, optimistic. I want to believe that it happened, and I think crazier things can happen. I think that from people that I know who are in the military, they are some hardy motherfuckers. They're very true. Uh, the shit that they do to train is ridiculous. The amount of just walking around and hiking and hoofing it in fucking boots with a giant pack on your back. If this dude was really in the military and he was as well-trained as they say he was, yeah, it probably would have been a breeze. And who knows if he actually had some special force, special force, oration, special force operations training, then he probably would have gone through a very extensive wilderness and uh, mountaineering course because modern day special forces train in you know, I mean, the Rangers alone and other special forces operations train in like swamps. They train in, they do mountaineering. They do wilderness training. Obviously, this is modern day versus um, back then. But I think the survival skills still apply. He used the stars. He used a general knowledge of the terrain and cartography. And who knows what else he had in that briefcase. Maybe that bomb wasn't real. Maybe he in his briefcase he had a bunch of like... Survival gear. I want to believe that he made it if he's a good dude. I do too. Maybe he had, uh, it was just a bunch of hot dogs that looked like uh, dynamite. Because I tell you, Andy, I'm at the grocery store and I'm looking at those, 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 uh, those, those huge those Franks, packs. those Franks and those, those Vienna beef those sausages. party packs. And I'm thinking, is that a stick of dynamite? Oh my God. Every time I walk past the meat counter at the <laughs> grocery store. There's a pack of dynamite next to the bacon. I shout out, there's a bomb in the store. Yeah. And then I jump on it because I'm a hero. Because I want to save everyone else. <laughs> I run out the front doors. <laughs> I throw a worker on it. Um, and then it turns out it's just hot dogs. They make me buy them. Because I soiled them with I, my body. I laid on them. <laughs> I soiled them with my belly. <laughs> my exposed belly. <laughs> Actually, knowing some of the grocery stores around here, they'd probably uh, upcharge you. Yeah. For belly scraped. Belly. Dogs. Belly. I don't know why I said that. Grocery stores don't upcharge. <laughs> no, I get that all the time. If I check the if I check the firmness of a melon, they give me that fingered melon upcharge. <laughs> <laughs> well, listeners, we've landed. Welcome to bright, beautiful Enchiladaville. Enchiladaville. Where the temperature is mole sauce, and <laughs> it's delicious outside. You've safely made it all this way. You know, uh, our captain, our co, our pilots are me and Andy. We'd like to thank you for being on this journey with us. Um, Andy, are there any last things that you want to say about the the dude? 
the dude, the dude B Cooper, dude B Cooper. Um, I will say this art in closing. Okay. I don't think they'll ever figure it out. No, I don't think so either. I think it'll be a mystery for the ages because we don't even know if that tie is his. Yeah. That's another thing. The tie might not be his. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Who I knows? think it'll be a mystery forever. I think that dude made it scot-free. Or he died. Or he died. Well, which then he got scot-free. Yeah. Um, well, listeners, uh, for the titular bunker and Andy Hart, I am Arthur Stone saying, that was the whole enchilada. Keep flying the friendly skies. Yummy. Yummy.